Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Pastor Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel. We invite you to get your Bible and join us if you care to. We're going to pick it up today, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 27. And chapter 19 began with how God saw it that man's uh, relationship with Him, uh, meaning the Father, should be and now we've switched gears and we're talking about how men should treat men. And it all comes down to the golden rule. You know, we should treat others as we would like to be treated ourselves. And that's the way that you have a moral society. Uh, people treating each other as though they were treating, the, the, as they wanted to be treated themselves, in other words. And we had just gotten into one verse into a new uh, branch of chapter 19. And we learned there that we're not to uh, eat animals in their blood, meaning that they've not been properly bl bled. And then also to stay away from uh, those who use enchantment or observe time. So uh, God calling uh, Israel to be holy, Vayikara in the Hebrew tongue is the title, Leviticus. And God did call the nation to be holy and he's teaching them the difference between clean and unclean, between holy and unholy as he prepares them to move into a very unclean land, that being the land of the Canaanites, the promised land. With that introduction, let's ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day Leviticus chapter 19, verse 27, and it reads, Ye shall not round the corners of your head, neither shalt thou mar the corners of thy beard. And to mar the beard is, simply means to shave the beard, either partially or entirely. The Hebrew men were to wear a full beard uh, at all times. Now this round the corners of your heads is referring to a style, is probably a good word, of a haircut that was popular among the Arabs and the Canaanitish priests. And it was basically to cut the hair below the temple line entirely. Uh, you could think of taking a, a small bowl and placing it over one's head and then cutting everything that was visible. And uh, again, God is saying, I, I, not only do I, I, I don't want you, not only do I not want you to act like the heathens, I don't even want you to look like the heathens. Verse 28, you shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print marks upon you, I am the Lord. And this is in some parts of the world is still practiced today that uh, when someone passes away, uh, those who were close to them or thought highly of them uh, make cuts and, and draw blood uh, as a sign of mourning. Uh, this was also a practice, of course, of the heathens. The marks upon you, we're talking about uh, changing the color of the pigment of the skin uh, through the use of inks and dyes, things of that nature. Tattoos is basically what we're talking about. But God's saying when you lose a family member, you don't mourn uh, or grieve by making cuts in, in your own flesh as the heathen do. And you don't uh, make tattoos in, on your, your uh, body uh, profaning God's creation uh, or to revere God's creation. And you know, he created us the way he wanted us. And, um, but anyway, verse 29, do not prostitute thy daughter to cause her to be a whore, lest the land fall to whoredom and the land become 
full of wickedness, uh, prostitution, any place that it takes a hold on a place is usually a pretty immoral place. Uh, we have cities uh, or states in the United States where prostitution is legalized. They're not known for uh, being very moral places. This word uh, wickedness in the Hebrew is zima, and it refers specifically to physical uh, whoredom, uh, physical prostitution. There are places in the Bible where it talks about spiritual prostitution. Uh, this is specifically speaking of physical prostitution. Verse 30, you shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. And we've been talking about immoral things. Now, what brings morality to a society? Well, a, a close relationship with God causes people to be, to revere Him. Uh, to revere Him, true reverence awakens uh, confidence in the Lord and, and to follow His guidance. You know, you know, that's what they were talking about in verse 26. He said, don't talk to those who use enchantments. This is to uh, prophesy the future events uh, basically out of nothing. They, they don't know the future events, but God's saying don't run to those who use enchantments or who observe times uh, seeking guidance. Lean on me, the Lord's saying. That's, what he, that's all he ever really wanted. He wanted his children to trust him and to allow him to guide them through life in the flesh. And uh, reverencing his sanctuary is a good place to start. Verse 31, Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards, to be defiled by them, I am the Lord your God. And wizards are those with occult knowledge, uh, think that they have the prophes ability to prophesy future events, in other words. Familiar spirits uh, are those possessed with an evil spirit. Uh, the, the word, the term can be uh, familiar spirits means a necromancer and that is someone like a ventriloquist. And what they do, they're either possessed with an evil spirit or they summons up an evil spirit to supposedly speak for someone who has passed away. That was what the witch of Endor was. She was a familiar spirit. And uh, of course, Saul uh, summoned her up trying to seek the counsel of Samuel who had already passed away. God's saying it's evil, it's wicked, don't do it. Verse 32, thou shalt rise up uh, before the hoary head and honor the face of the old man and fear thy God, I am the Lord. And to rise up, in other words, in reverence. And those of you who don't know, the word hoary head means a gray head. We're, we're talking about our elders and God encourages us to be respectful of our elders. And, you know, that's, that's uh, any moral society respects their elders. If you've got a bunch of punks running around that make fun of the elderly and cause the elderly problems, uh, you can bet it's not a very moral society. Verse 33. And if a stranger sojourn with thee in your land, ye shall not vex him. The word vex means to uh, oppress him or to be violent to him. Uh, and a stranger, of course, we're talking about a foreigner, someone that's not of the twelve tribes of Israel. But the stranger that dwelleth with you uh, shall be unto you as one born among you, subject uh, to the same laws as the Israelites, uh, able to have the same privileges as the Israelites for the most part. Um, and, you know, consider anyone who moved and moved 
into Israel and, and lived among the Israelites believed in Yahweh. That's the only reason that they would have moved there. And thou shalt love him as thyself, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. God uh, saying, remember, just not much more than a year ago, you were strangers or foreigners in the land of Egypt. And, you know, the, the, Israel didn't have it all that bad in Egypt. Did they work hard? Yes, it was slave labor. But how many came uh, of Israel into Egypt at the very beginning? Uh, how about 70? Seven zero is the number of men uh, of the descendants of Jacob who went to Egypt. And they were about to starve to death. If they hadn't gone to Egypt, they probably would have starved to death because there was a terrible famine in the land. Well, how many Israelites came out some 400 years later? Well, at the first numbering in the book of Numbers, there were over 603,500 fighting men. That's men who are able to pick up a sword. That's not counting elderly men. It's not counting uh, children, uh, boys and girls. It's not counting women and wives. Uh, so I estimate the population of Israel at the time they came out of Egypt was about 2.1 million people. 400 years, 70 to uh, 2.1 million, uh, God's watching out for them. And uh, he, he didn't allow the Egyptians to treat them too badly. But what he's saying is, you know, you know love him as thyself. That's, that's the same, the message of this chapter 19 is love your neighbor as thyself. Uh, treat your neighbor as you would like to be treated yourself. And of course that is, all depends on that neighbor abiding by the law. Now if your neighbor is not abiding by the law, you, you're not obliged by this to love him. You're obliged by the law to admonish him, to, to uh, warn him that he needs to straighten up. <clears throat> Verse 35, Ye shall do no unrighteousness in judgment, in meat yard, which is a, a measure, in weight or in measure. And this is, has to do with cheating. Uh, in other words, when you, when you have business uh, relations with someone or you're in business for yourself, don't cheat people. Let's do the next verse and we'll talk about it a little more. Verse 36, just balances, just weights, a just ephath, which is a measure, a just hen, another form of measure, shall ye have. I am the Lord your God. Notice the repetition of the sacred name. I am the Lord your God, adding emphasis, which brought you out of the land of Egypt. Uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 13 through 16, we learn there that it's uh, against God's law to have two sets of stones. And if you check out this word weights in verse 36 in the Hebrew, it is stones in the Hebrew language. It's what it was translated from. And when people bought goods, having two sets of stones, they would have one set of stones for buying goods, and then they would switch it and have another set of stones for selling goods. And what it was doing was they were buying more of the product uh, than they were selling, calling it a hen or an ephath, for example. And, and that may sound like that, well, that doesn't apply to me today. It does apply to you today. What God is saying is, that if you're in business, treat your customers fairly. Uh, give them a just value for what they are giving you in, uh, money in most cases today, of course. And what happens if you do that? Well, if you do that, uh, likely the customer will return. And any good businessman knows the value of clientele who return to do business with you. On the other hand, if you cheat someone and they catch you doing it, 
what is the likelihood that they will come back uh, to your business again? Uh, zero, verse 37. Therefore shall ye observe all my statutes and all my judgments, and do them, I am the Lord. And uh, chapter 20, we come to uh, unlawful defilements. Uh, also in chapter 18 and 19, we we're covering uh, a lot of law that was given at Sinai, and we're going to see in chapter 20 the punishments for violating the law that was to be administered to those who violated. Chapter 20, verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, and we always know we're switching gears when you see a phrase like that. Verse 2, Again thou shalt say to the children of Israel, Whosoever he be of the children of Israel, or of the strangers, foreigners again, that sojourn or live in Israel, that giveth any of his seed, his children, unto Molech, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones." Now, what people did, the, the, the Molech was a god of the uh, Ammonites, uh, uh, Chemosh, uh, very closely related, of the Moabites. So. Uh, what we have here is people that sacrificed their children to the god Molech or Chemosh by fire. And God is very jealous God. And he doesn't want people giving their children or sacrificing their children to another god, small g. He doesn't even want people to sacrifice their children to him. but to do this was the ultimate uh, rejection of him. In Exodus chapter 34, verse 14, God says, Don't worship other gods. My name is Jealous, and that's Jealous with the capital J. The people of Judah uh, and Israel fell into this in, in sincerity, uh, Manasseh, uh, probably the most wicked king of Judah. He caused the streets of Jerusalem to run with innocent blood. But Second Chronicles chapter 33, verse 6, the king of Judah uh, offered his seed children to Molech. Verse 3, And I, the Lord speaking, will set my face against that man and will cut him off from among his people because he hath given of his seed unto Molech to defile my sanctuary and to profane my holy name. And uh, it'll be clarified a little more in the following verses. But what God is saying here is in verse uh, uh, 2, he instructed the people of Israel, if someone uh, passes their children through the fire, sacrificing them to Molech, they're to be stoned to death. And what God's saying here, the nation should be responsible for carrying out the will of God. But if you don't, I will take care of it myself, is what the Lord is saying here. All sins defile the sanctuary, verse 4. And if the people of the land do anyways hide their eyes from the man, the man who passes his children through the fire to Molech, when he giveth of his seed unto Molech, and kill him not, uh, whether that be through uh, indifference or secret approval. But what this is saying, to, to turn their head uh, or hide their eyes, means that they turn their heads, and, and either in uh, secret approval or indifference, they don't follow God's instructions and stone uh, the idolater to death. Verse 5, Then I, the Lord speaking, will set my face against that man and against his family and will cut him off and all that go a-whoring after him. And that's uh, God sharing his raw emotions with it. That's just exactly the way he feels about it. Uh, idolatry is that they're whoring after him. To commit whoredom with Molech from among their people. God does not uh, like idolatry. And 
I can hear many today would say, well, you don't understand Pastor Murray. We, we, would, we, we go to church every Sunday. We, we, we would never commit idolatry in our church. And here they're being taught the rapture theory. They're being set up to fall for the Antichrist hook, line, and sinker. And how is God going to look upon that? Well, you know, he's expecting a virgin bride when he returns. Those who are spiritually in bed with the Antichrist when he returns are going to be idolaters. That's exactly the way he will look at it. And the reason that he would cut the man and his family off, well, is the, the, fa the whole family was practicing idolatry, in other words. Verse 6, And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits, and after wizards, those with occult knowledge, to go a whoring after them, this is very closely related to idolatry, I will even set my face against that soul and will cut him off from among his people. I will judge and punish uh, those who do this. And the actual punishment uh, for uh, seeking out those who are wizards or have familiar spirits will cover in verse 27 of this same chapter. And God saying, either you the people take care of it uh, or I will take care of it. Verse 7. Sanctify, this means to uh, separate yourselves from the unclean and the unholy. Yourselves therefore, and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. This one verse uh, very, reminds me very much of the title of this book, Vayikara, uh, and he called. God called the nation of Israel to be holy because he was holy. And the whole book teaching the people of Israel the difference between clean and unclean, holy and unholy. Verse 8, And you shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctify you. The word keep in the Hebrew language, shamar. It means to uh, attend to or to protect as, as something valuable. Or it can't even mean to hedge about like with a wall of thorns, uh, protected in other words. And I like this verse, to, to keep my statutes and do them. You see, there's a lot of difference between hearing the Word of God and doing the Word of God. James chapter 1 verse 22, it states there to be ye hearers of the Word and doers of the Word not just hearers only deceiving yourself. Uh, you know, that's the way with many uh, today too, is that uh, if you attend church regularly, and, but then the very next day you're out in the ways of the world. In other words, you go to church on Sunday and hear the Word of God, hopefully, uh, and then Monday you disregard what you heard on Sunday and you're right back in the old ways of the world. You're deceiving yourself if you think you found salvation because uh, God won't be mocked. Whatever we, mo whatever we sow, we will reap. Verse 9, For everyone that curseth his father or his mother shall be surely put to death. He hath cursed his father or his mother. His blood shall be upon him. This word curse that is kalal, and the, the prime is to, to make light of. Uh, it can also be translated to despise. Uh, Jesus endorsed Moses as the uh, writer of the book of Leviticus in Mark chapter 7, verse 10, because of this verse. Uh, the uh, scripture lawyers there were uh, just, just trying to say to his people, you know, uh, to the disciples, how come you don't wash your hands as the traditions of the elders? And we're not talking about washing the dirt off their hand before they sat down to a meal. We're talking about going through this ritualistic washing that the elders of the church prescribed. It wasn't in God's word, but 
Jesus dressed them down there and he said, you know, Moses said to honor your mother and father, but you say as long as it's Corbin, a gift to the church, it's all right to dishonor your mother and father. In other words, if your mother and father are hungry and rather than going and buying food for them, you make a gift to the church, then that's what the, Jesus said to them. You, you are disavowing the word of God with your traditions of men. Verse 10, And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. And we saw one exception to that, and that was in the case of a bondmaid or a slave, if you will, in chapter 19, verse 20. The penalty for adultery, uh, death, verse 11. And the man that lieth with his father's wife hath uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And uh, in the Hebrew, the father's wife is very specific. We're talking here about uh, a stepmother. And to lie carnally, uh, copulate with your father's wife is to uncover his nakedness. That's exactly what it means. And the uh, penalty, uh, his blood shall be upon him, the, them, they'll be put to death. Uh, no mention here of, of if he lay with a mother or a grandmother, uh, granddaughter, excuse me, uh, but likely taken for granted that the penalty was death as well. Uh, Genesis chapter 9, uh, we have there uh, probably one of the most mistaught uh, chapters in the Bible concerning uh, Ham uncovering Noah's nakedness. People don't understand what that means. Well, it means that he had sexual intercourse with his own mother. Uh, that resulted in a pregnancy and the birth of Cain, uh, Canaan, excuse me. And what had happened then? Well, Noah cursed Canaan and sent him away. Why? He didn't want a reminder of his, uh, the incestuous relationship that happened. But of course, the law of incest had not been given at that point in time. But it's falsely taught that God cursed Canaan and turned his skin black. And that's the origin, origin of the black race. And that's nonsense. Verse 12, And if a man lie with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have wrought confusion. Their blood shall be upon them. And just as with the daughter uh, or the full sister, is not mentioned here in the prohibitions. Uh, but again, it's assumed, it's taken for granted that the penalty would be death. This word confusion in the Hebrew is tabel, and it means mixture. <clears throat> Verse 13, If a man also lie with mankind, as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death their blood shall be upon them. The penalty under God's law for homosexuality, death. He thinks it's an abomination. And, uh, you know, there's legislation that came up and they're threatening uh, people such as myself uh, who teach the Word of God that they're going to make it to where we're guilty of hate crimes for teaching the truth of God's Word. Well, uh, they can forget it as far as this preacher is concerned because I will continue to teach God's Word as it is written, and I'll not apologize for it. Am I teaching hate? No, actually I'm teaching love, tough love, but it is love because God says if you do this, it's an abomination to me. And here we have laws that we've passed in our land now making it okay for same-sex marriage, to legalize it. <clears throat> We're turning things upside down. We're taking what is wrong and saying it's right. They take what is right uh, and say it is wrong. 
Well, you don't understand, Pastor Murray. You're in the Old Testament. We, we now live under the New Testament. Well, if you live under the New Testament and you practice homosexuality, you're not very familiar with the New Testament. Romans chapter 1, verses 24 through 27. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10. All put homosexuality in its place. It is an abomination to our Heavenly Father. It's perversion, verse 14. And if a man take a wife and her mother, it is wickedness. They shall be burnt with fire, <clears throat> both he and they, that there be no wickedness among you. And this, of course, they would be killed first and then as a further punishment would be burned. Uh, this happened in Joshua chapter 7, verse 25. Not the same crime, but uh, someone committed the accursed thing there, stole the accursed thing, uh, and they uh, killed him and his family and then burned them. <coughs> Excuse me, in Deuteronomy 27, 20, uh, this is taking a wife and a mother. Uh, to, this is speaking of a mother-in-law, in other words, in Deuteronomy 27, 20, uh, taking your own mother-in-law and laying with her carnally is a, an accursed crime. Verse 15, <clears throat> Excuse me. And if a man lie with a beast, he shall surely be put to death, and ye shall slay the beast. And bestiality forbidden by God's law. <clears throat> the Egyptians, uh, with whom they came out of bondage, were practicing bestiality. Uh, the Canaanites, who had uh, were known to mix with the fallen angels, uh, practiced bestiality as well. Verse 16, and then we'll stop for the day. And if a woman approach unto a beast and lie down thereto, this is rabah in the Hebrew, and it means to lie down in copulation. Thou shalt kill the woman and the beast. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And again, the heathens were practicing this. God said, I don't want you to uh, do like the heathens do. I'm holy. I'm calling you to be holy. Well, we'll come back and finish this chapter in our next lecture. we got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It's getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. No shipping and handling. Just call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also mail your request to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Welcome back. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4645. That number good throughout Puerto Rico the U.S. and Canada. If you have a biblical question that you'd like to pose to be answered on the air, feel free to call that number and leave your question. Please don't ask questions about a specific individual, denomination, or organization by name. Uh, we teach God's Word in a positive manner. Throwing out negative about others by name serves no purpose. We simply won't do it. We'll let God's Word do the teaching, the correcting, and the healing fully capable of all three. If you're uh, studying via the internet somewhere around the world and unable to use that 800 number, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Quite all right to mail your questions in being the point. <clears throat> Got a prayer request? Well, you don't need a telephone number. We can do away with it. You don't need a mailing address. Your Heavenly Father is there for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I encourage you to develop your relationship with Him. 
How do you do that? Well, you, you study the letter that he wrote to you so that you know how to be pleasing to him, but you talk to him in prayer. Make time each day to talk with your heavenly Father. When you have major decisions in your life, you won't find a better counselor than your heavenly Father, so uh, <clears throat> consider it. We do have these prayer requests, Father. We come united as one in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, Father. We ask you to look upon these. You know uh, their situations, Father. Uh, marital problems, uh, illnesses, Father, you know. If it is your will, a special blessing on each of these. We also lift up our military troops <clears throat> in harm's way and also our law enforcement officers uh, that do the, such a wonderful job in protecting our ourselves. Father, we ask you to watch over God, direct, touch, heal, in Jesus' precious name. Amen and thank you, Father. All right, let's get to some questions and see what's on the mind of folks around the country. First up today, we have Annette in Tennessee. And by his stripes, we are healed. Isaiah uh, 53, 5 states, with his stripes are we are healed. I was told this means a spiritual healing, not a physical healing. Is this true? Well, James chapter 5 verse 14 states that when you are sick, physically sick, uh, to call the elders and for them to anoint in his name, in the name of Jesus Christ, and be physically healed. So what is the meaning of spiritual healing? Well, if your soul is sick, then you need a spiritual healing. You know, we can even be spiritually dead. Uh, your sickness can get to the point that you're spiritually dead, such as the dry bones in the valley in Ezekiel chapter 37. Uh, and you follow with one last question, when we say, the gospel of Jesus Christ, doesn't this mean or include physical healing? Well, if you believe and ask for a healing, yes. <clears throat> God has the power to heal physically. God has the power to heal spiritually. And of course, what you do uh, uh, has a lot to do with that too, though. Uh, that's part of the purpose of Leviticus uh, teaching the people of Israel what's clean to eat and what's not clean. And if you don't read God's letter and enough to know what's clean and what's not clean to eat, you could suffer physical consequences by eating what he told you not to eat. <clears throat> and of course, we all can take responsibility partially for our physical, our spiritual well-being as well. <clears throat> Nicholas in Georgia. Can you explain where Great Britain, where the people descended from, uh, from a biblical, genealogical perspective? Can any of this information be found in the Strong's Concordance? Now, you won't find anything that will help you uh, identify what you're talking about <clears throat> in the Strong's Concordance. Uh, make a note of Genesis uh, chapter 48, verse 11 and the following verses. And this is where <clears throat> Jacob is blessing his 12 sons, the patriarchs, uh, in the case of Joseph, uh, his grandsons, Manasseh and Ephraim. I believe Manasseh and Ephraim, <clears throat> excuse me, are Great Britain and the United States of today. The 10 tribes, the 10 northern tribes, who after the Assyrian captivity went north over the Caucasus Mountains and thus being called the Caucasian peoples. They settled in Europe, uh, Great Britain included, and many then migrated on to the United States. 99.9% uh, .9 of them don't even have a clue as to who they are today. Jeff in California, I enjoy your teaching on the New Testament more than your teaching on the Old. Well, okay, thank you. Also, I am a believer in the pre-tribulation rapture of the church from reading 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 17, especially verse 17, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. 
and thus we shall always be with the Lord, the dead in Christ first, then believers who are alive. The Old Testament's timeline from Adam to the second coming didn't include the church being caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air prior to the seven years of tribulation. Jeff, you need to keep studying. Uh, you know, time is growing short. Uh, the Antichrist is coming. The Antichrist is coming first, and people who believe as Jeff, as I said earlier, are being set up hook, line, and sinker to worship the Antichrist. They're taught that we're going to fly away and we're not going to be here when the Antichrist is here. That's not what God, God's Word says. 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4, if you want to know what the true subject of that is, start reading in verse 13. And Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant as the heathen are about where the dead are. That's what 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 15, 16, and 17 about is where are the dead. And those of you who remain in the flesh until Christ returns uh, can't precede. It says prevent in the King James. It's an old English word that means precede those who have died. Why? They're already with him. That's where the dead are. They're with God. Emmett in South Carolina, <clears throat> do you believe in the Trinity? Absolutely. Uh, if you listen to uh, a pastor of Shepherd's Chapel speak for any length of time, you're going to hear the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, there's a, a Bible study on that subject done by Pastor Arnold Murray entitled Nature of God, and that's CD 30574 if you want a full study on what our beliefs concerning the Trinity. Uh, there are uh, critics out there of Shepherd's Chapel who state on the internet and other places that we don't teach the Trinity. As I said, anybody who listens any length of time knows that we teach the Trinity. <clears throat> Teresa from Michigan, I know our bodies are different in the new millennium, but knowing we will have different uh, and beautiful fruits and things, will we have to use the toilet? <laughs> because that's one earthly thing I will be happy to shed. And why doesn't it say anything in the Bible about anybody's body, especially Jesus, using the bathroom? And if it does, where is it written? I know I have read Leviticus about the cleanness. So, well, no, it's not written anywhere in the Bible about someone using the toilet. But I'm with you, and I don't think that toilets are something that we will need, uh, that we need them in our flesh bodies, but our spiritual bodies won't. Uh, and you follow with another question. I have a con strong concordance and I'm studying names and numbers, but I seem to be having a hard time with the numbers. Where can I find the meaning uh, that number five means grace, uh, 40 means probation, and so on? Uh, is there a book I can uh, order? Yes, the uh, book number four, Biblical Mathematics, it goes into what you're talking about is uh, the significance of, of numbers in the Bible. Uh, and that's where you'll find, uh, again, order book number four, Biblical Mathematics, and that will take you through the meaning of the numbers, give you examples in the Bible of where the, how it came to be that that number uh, is symbolic of what it is symbolic of. Bill in Texas. What are the measurements of heaven? Okay, Revelation chapter 21, verse 16. It states that the length, breadth, and height of heaven, uh, this is heaven in the, the eternity, the third earth and heaven age, is 12,000 furlongs. In other words, it's a cube. Uh, its length, its width, and its height are all equal distances. 12,000 furlongs is approximately 1,500 miles. And you might say, well, that seems awful small for uh, getting 
all God and all of his children into it, well, remember, we'll be in spiritual bodies at the time. <clears throat> Timothy from Michigan. I love watching your program and uh, is so uplifting and helps me understand the gospel so much more. We're glad you enjoy studying. Uh, my question to you is, how can you tell when there's demons or bad spirits around you? And are some spirits stronger than other spirits? And if so, how do you deal with stronger spirits? Well, Jesus taught us how to deal with all of our enemies in Luke chapter 10, verses 17 and 18. Even the demons were subject to the orders of the disciples when they address them in the name of Jesus Christ. That's very important. Don't forget to do it in the name of Jesus Christ. That's where the power is. Uh, if you go up against Satan and his evil spirits without the power of Christ, they will beat you up and, and put the hurt on you. <clears throat> Vincent in North Carolina. If Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden would have seen a serpent, wouldn't they have just killed it like we do nowadays? Being Lucifer, Satan, the accuser, the glistening one is so subtle, why didn't he come as a handsome man to Eve to tempt her instead of a vile snake? I love you all at Shepherd's Chapel and thank you for your time and we love you as well, Vincent. And uh, you know, Ezekiel chapter 28 tells us that God created uh, Satan. He's called the, the king of Tyrus there. But he created Satan the full pattern, uh, full of wisdom and beauty. He was a good-looking rascal. Uh, and that's how he appeared to Eve. And the serpent is simply... Uh, symbolic. It's, it's not he was an actual snake. An actual snake could not have impregnated Eve. Uh, Satan appeared to her as a, a handsome young man and she was seduced as it uh, reads in the New Testament uh, where it states that uh, Paul saying that I don't want you to be uh, beguiled as Eve was, beguiled in the Greek tongue, expateo, and it means wholly seduced. <clears throat> That's what happened in the Garden of Eden. Larry in Minnesota, one of my nieces is married to a pastor that teaches the traditions of men instead of the Word of God. How does the second epistle of John verses 10 and 11 apply to this situation? I love my niece. She is a blood relative. Well, uh, then of course uh, the first uh, or the second epistle of John, verses ten and eleven, Paul's uh, John's teaching there states that if anyone comes to you and doesn't have this doctrine, the doctrine of Christ, in other words, don't invite them into your house. Don't wish them Godspeed. And that means it's a, a figure of speech, actually, that means to support them. Uh, uh, wishing them Godspeed is a simple salutation, like, have a nice day. In other words, don't even say have a nice day to them, much less tithe to them or support them. Now, having said that, your niece will always be your niece. As you said, she is a blood relative. She always will be a blood relative. And, you know, if you can't uh, be in her presence with her husband with her and discuss religion, then don't discuss religion. Talk about politics or something else. But uh, uh, that's, that's how you handle that situation. Louise in Missouri, I listen to you a lot and have learned a lot. I like your teaching. I know the old devil comes first. I didn't know that before, so thanks a lot for teaching me. You sure don't hear this in church. I wish everyone knew this, but they won't listen. Was the fig tree set out by someone, or was it when Israel became a state? Did it happen then? I want to learn that. Well, Israel became a state again, a nation again in 1948, and that is the year that the uh, 
fig tree was set uh, in uh, and that is likely the year 48. It could possibly have been 1967. There was another uh, event that happened in 67 that you might consider that. But uh, if you don't understand the parable of the fig tree, uh, you need to. And uh, there's on, on page three of every monthly newsletter, you'll find a list of suggested studies for new students. and. Uh, we encourage those who are new to our ministry and the Word of God for that matter to study those suggested tapes. There's one on there called Parable of the Fig Tree. Very critical. Jesus said in, in, in the New Testament that you learn the parable of the fig tree. He didn't say maybe you should. He said learn it. Elizabeth in Georgia, where is it where the Antichrist will come first. Well, 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, verse 1 through 4 gets it said. Uh, Paul said, I want to talk to you about the return of Jesus Christ. And he goes on to say it's not going to happen until the first there's a great falling away. That means an apostasy. The apostasy is on. And that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Uh, Revelation chapter 13, the second beast that comes there is the Antichrist. Where does it say a woman can't wear men's clothing? Deuteronomy chapter 22 verse 5 states that a woman should not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, and a man shall not put on a woman's garment. It's a figure of speech. It means that a woman should not take a man's place in sexual intercourse or vice versa. In other words, it's saying, uh, we studied today, homosexuality is an abomination to God. That's what Deuteronomy 22, 5 says. Not talking about literally wearing clothes and because you hear people say today that a woman shouldn't wear pants because of that scripture. Well, you see, in the days of Deuteronomy, men didn't wear pants. Uh, they wore skirts. Douglas in California, why do you use the terms Lord, God, and Jesus, but at the end of your program, you will pray us out and pray us out and use the sacred name? Isn't using the other terms in place of his sacred name a violation of the second and third commandment. And given what it says in Acts 2.38, there is only one name in which we can be saved. He was given the name Yeshua, and isn't it so that we don't translate names but transliterate? Uh, and then you go on to say, I do tune into your program at 5.30. Uh, you have enriched my studies. May our master increase and bless you in your ministry. Well, thank you for that. Uh, if you have a companion Bible, uh, Doug, make a note of Appendix 4. And you'll find there that God has many names that he calls himself. So we're not limited to one thing that we should call God. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. Well, you said violation of the second and third commandment. The second commandment is you'll have no graven image before you. So I don't know how you're tying that to not using the sacred name. The third commandment is thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain, which means uh, denying God or saying God is nothing or uh, making an oath in his name and then not following through with what you said the oath was. Elizabeth in Colorado. In Genesis 36, why is Esau's children called Duke? Why does it have Duke before their name? Well, Duke in the Hebrew is a, a title. Uh, the Hebrew word is aluf, and it means uh, chieftain. It's also been translated captain or governor. Uh, Deanna in South Carolina. How do we know when the Antichrist comes? I know that it is at the sixth trump, but how will I know that it is him? Well, Revelation chapter 13, verse 13 uh, states that he will have supernatural powers. 
He's going to be able to snap his fingers and make lightning come down from heaven. You better be spiritually and mentally prepared for that. A uh, good rule of thumb to go by is that if someone is standing in front of you claiming to be Jesus Christ and you pinch yourself and you're still in the flesh, it's not Jesus Christ because when he returns at the seventh trump in the twinkling of an eye, we all go into our spiritual bodies. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, and the following verses. Cynthia in Nebraska, I have heard you say, Come, Lord Jesus, come, and let those bricks fall where they may. What do you mean when you say these? Well, uh, to come, Lord Jesus, come, means that I'm anxious for the Lord to return at the second advent. And I think he's the only one who can straighten this mess out. Uh, and we don't say, well, let the bricks fall where they may. We say, let the chips fall where they may. And what that means is that uh, I'm going to tell the truth regardless of the consequences. That's what let the chips fall where they may. I'm not going to pull any punches about what God's Word says uh, regardless of the consequences. Out of time, I love you all a great deal. Why? Because you enjoy studying the letter that God wrote to you, the Bible. You know, when, when he looks down and he sees you studying that letter, it makes his day. Good things are going to happen. Blessings always follow when you please the Lord. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. One thing most important, though, and it's this, you stay in his word every day. You know, every day in our Father's word is a good day, even when there's trouble in life. You know why? It's because Jesus Yeshua, he is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.